Yo, 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 what's going on? <laughs> hey, we're going to do a rap show. That's right. We don't going to cover a rap show. Sorry, I'm like really tired. Like, I don't even know if I could do this show right now. I'm going to try my best. So please excuse my loopy energy. We're going to do the best we can do tonight. Uh, I'll do the housekeeping stuff in a little bit. Let's, let's just dive into it first and foremost. So we're talking Dee Dee Ramone tonight. We recently covered Johnny Ramone in uh pretty in-depth detail, at least in the, the eighties, right? Turn on the fan here. What did we talk about with Johnny Ramone? We talked about how he almost died and, you know, cut his hair short. And we also... We looked at something else. I'm trying to remember what else we looked at with uh, Johnny Ramone. We've talked about Joey a little bit. I don't think we've talked much about Marky. Eventually, we're going to get into the, the fight. Yes, that's right. We did talk about Marky versus Johnny Rotten. We've done a, a Tommy interview, but we have not done anything that's Dee Dee related. Really, we haven't. So it's time to change that right now. So that's what we're discussing tonight we're talking about not only are we talking about dd we're actually talking about dd ramon when he transformed himself dd ramon reinvented himself and turned himself into dd king which is a play on bb king and um i guess to understand dd king you need to understand dd ramon's mindset in the 80s and you know the tail end of the 80s and eventually you know uh his exit from the ramones his transformation into dd king seemed to start before he actually exited the ramones and then what we're going to do after we take a look at this we gotta actually listen we're going to listen to standing in the spotlight dd ramones uh rap album now, here's the irony of the rap album. This is what's so funny. And it ultimately says something about, like, you know, you can take the punk rocker. You can't take the punk out of the rocker, but you can take the rocker out of the punk. I don't know. That's not the right way to say that. But you know what I mean? And in in this case, in this case, it's like, no matter how hard Dee Dee Ramone tries to not be a punk rocker, he goes and he makes a rap album and it ends up having a song like the crusher on it, which ends up getting recorded by the Ramones and is one of their best later era songs. So it's kind of funny how even trying to move out of writing punk rock, Dee Dee still ends up putting out stuff that's sort of like punk rock. That's right. Funk, 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 funk funky. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We should actually look at that too. Uh, what's interesting too is that you know Dan Daniel Ray, who produced all the those later era Ramones albums, he also produced the Misfits '95. I mean, he was like he's like an eternal disciple, you know, faithful follower of the Ramones. In fact, it was Daniel Ray who actually sold Johnny Ramones' guitar for a million dollars, right? He was helping Dee Dee write this album and, you know, help help write this album he did to the best of his ability. Um, and we got we got what it is that we got from uh <laughs> in the form of this album. You'll have to excuse me. I have um terrible, terrible sinus allergies. I took a Zyrtec. I hope that does the trick. There might be some sneezing. Um, let's launch into, let's launch into this right now. First, we're going to take a look at, uh, the oral history of Didi Ramon's bizarre rap album career. This is, this is a great little piece. Here we go. Put on your punk rock history caps, kids. How this is from clairvoyant. I guess that's how that's supposed to be spelled. And it's written by uh, Shane Me Mechling. And it's from November 30th, 2016. How Dee Dee Ramone's bizarre rap album came to be. 
Uh, when an album is described as like nothing you ever heard it before, that usually means it's either a transcendent success or an unprecedented failure. Standing in the spotlight by D.D. D. King might be both. I, I would I would have to say that's a that's a pretty good assessment right there. That's a pretty fair assessment. It's uh, transcendent of success and also an unprecedented failure. Although I don't like to use the word the the f word. I think it does apply in certain instances, instances, but not always. Dee Dee Ramone's 1989 rap album is as close to a universally reviled album as you can get. Interesting how the word reviled and revered are very, very close to each other. It's kind of like being humiliated or it's kind of like asking for humility or receiving humiliation. You ever notice the, the connection there with that? Um, due to both music and lyrics and what many listeners perceive it either to be either a brazen act of hubris by a rock star, ding, 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 or the recorded delusions of grandeur from a struggling addict, also ding, ding, ding. This is a great writer um, who wrote this. And from his opening demand that it's time to rock, it's time to rap, it's time for the mashed potato attack. Have you ever listened to Standing in the Spotlight? It really is. It's unreal. Like, here's the thing. Remember how I said, like, um, he's trying to, he, he he goes in to write, do a rap album, and he ends up coming out with a punk rock song, The Crusher. The irony is that Funky Man, which was the closest thing to a hip-hop track that Dee Dee ever did, isn't even on Standing in the Spotlight, and instead... You have all of these songs, many of which are almost like 50s rock and roll, punk rock. Like there's there's some rapping that's going on. <laughs> yeah. The journalist hit the funky nail on the funky head. That's right. That's right. That's good. That's good. Alan says the best right rappers, uh, D.D. King, Macho Man, Randy Savage, and three Tom Green. I will admit Tom Green is a really good rapper. Yo, we're not lying. We got the ceramic lion. My bum was on my head. My bum was on my head. I think you're forgetting snow. You know, in form because the color of the love of the boom boom. Yeah, I mean, you could say that's like reggae, like white boy reggae, but I also feel like there's a little rap edge to that too. So it's in form because the color of the love of the boom boom. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just so much, there's just so much to say. Um, most reacted in a similar flat fashion of slack jawed disbelief that this record was conceived, performed, and release. And sure, it is nearly possible to circle this square. <laughs> Man, the writing is great. Less than 15 years earlier, Dee Dee was pending, penning songs about male prostitution in Vietnam. And this album finds him taking surfing lessons from a mermaid on commotion in the ocean. He helped inspire generations of aspiring punks, but sings, we walked down the aisle and made a bond. The sculptor waved his magic wand and created a work of art. You and I will never part on the anarch <laughs> I can't say that word. Anachronistic ballad, baby doll. Decked out in gold chains and posing lovingly on a ghetto blaster seems like at best, some kind of awkward satire. Like, that's what's so funny about it. It is awkward satire that's being done so completely seriously. You know what I mean? Um, oh, my God. Oh, it's, just, it's just nuts. It's nuts. Um, but while it would be disingenuous to try and sell the record as objectively good... There, there's something undeniably compelling about it. I would say that it's kind of like the, Tommy Wiseau's The Room, personally. That's what I would say. It's like, it's so bad, it's good. The, it's done, you know, the thing about The Room and the thing about uh, Standing in the Spotlight is that they are both done with such utter conviction and belief in what they are doing by people who are just so eccentrically, eccentrically like out of their minds. In the case of Dee Dee, who's on all sorts of antidepressants and 
and, you know, chemical balancing drugs, you know, for his various, you know, psychosis, whatever he had going on, you know, and, and then being sober and then being like overly medicated while sober. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, he was, at, he's kind of out of his mind. He's like, even though he's, you know, technically sober, he's sort of out of his mind making this. Um, and as a result, because of that conviction in the art he's attempting to do, it is indeed compelling. I agree. On top of music that feels incompatible with rapping, it, yes, 100% is incompatible with rapping, uh, especially when you listen to The Crusher. If you listen to The Crusher, you're going, what, what, why, how is this a rap song? And what's funny is, what, what's really funny is, there's something about The Crusher, right? This is going to sound really weird. The, the, what I'm about to say, hot take, hot take so hot it's going to burn the roof of your mouth. I truly think that when Dee Dee was trying to write The Crusher, it wasn't like he was taking a punk rock song to fill out the album. I think that he legitimately was trying to write a rap song and it came out as The Crusher. That's what I hear when I listen to Dee Dee's version of The Crusher. Yes, so perfectly well stated. Uh, he thinks he understood the fundamentals of hip hop, but couldn't pull it off. That's an earworm I don't want. Uh, that's all the earworms, man. You can go fishing with those worms. Um, but yeah, uh, on top of the music that feels incompatible with rapping, DV's vocal delivery is so unusual and his lyrics so quotable that it invites repeated listens. And once you get over the initial shock, there are truly genuine hooks. I don't know about that. Uh, German kid will probably make you laugh the first dozen times you hear it. But at some point, the earworm, speaking of earworms, earworm chorus will have you singing half American, half German at random points in your day. And despite how pretentious it all may seem on the surface, the entire album has a surprise authenticity. That's what I was referring to in doing what he did with such conviction. You know what I mean? That results in some sort of uh, authenticity, whether he intended it or not, right? Uh, if there hadn't been money and celebrity behind Didi Ramon, Didi King would have likely found some acclaim as an outsider artist, maybe along the lines of like a Wesley Willis. You know what I mean? That's that's what that's who D.D. King would have been. He would have just been like a, a Wesley Willis type, you know, just eccentric, weird, you know, cultish songs like banana songs written on a Casio. There are only seven people listed in the credits of standing in the spotlight. Three of them, including D.D., have passed. Two others are Blondie's Debbie, Harry and Chris Stein, uh, who only make guest appearances. The ever faithful Blondie connection to the Ramones, you know, you can hear Debbie also on the Ramones. Go little Camaro, go ooh, ooh, mow, mow, mama, ooh, mow, mow. I mean, the Ramones hit some pretty low points themselves. <laughs> Thank you for the skulls. If you're just joining us, please leave some skulls in the live chat or in the comments. Please make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Uh, check out the Patreon and the YouTube and all that good-ish. The simplest explanation for DD is that he was an artist, eccentric as fuck. I agree. I agree, Floor. Good point. Great point. Well, well stated. Uh, there are only set right. We already said that. Uh, that leaves the men who took the lion's share of putting the album together. Co-writer, producer Daniel Ray and Eric Greg Gordon. Here's what they remember. So we get to hear from Daniel Ray co-writer and producer and Greg Gordon. It's amazing that we have such an inside fly on the wall as Daniel Ray, who's still alive, who could probably, you know, do his own Ramones documentary. If he really wanted to, like you could do an entire Ramones documentary starring Daniel Ray. He really was a fifth Ramon. Dee Dee's doctor recommended that he go in for a tune up uh, just to get his shit together his real first name is Doug, and all the brothers in there were calling him Doug E. Fresh. And when he came out of the hospital, he was a rapper. He was into rap. So he had gone, I guess, what they're, what they're really saying, I think he had gone to, when, he, when, when going in for a tune-up, I think he had gone to rehab. 
uh, of some kind. So there you go. Hey, Barbarian, thank you so much. Thank you. Glad you like the channel. Um, Gre Greg Gordon. Here's the engineer, Greg Gordon. The Ramones were one of the most influential bands ever. They were the Beatles to me. And we've said that before on the channel. The Ramones are kind of like the Beatles of punk rock. Not in the sense, not in... Not in, um, you know, in terms of sales, but in terms of influence, absolutely. One of them, absolutely. Uh, but they never made a lot of money. In their prime, they were playing 600-seat clubs. And I had heard Funky Man, the 12-inch single in 1987, and knew DD had had a falling out with the band and was exploring other avenues. I mean, again, and they'll probably say it in this article, for, for DD, the Ramones had become a prison. D, you know, it was fresh, interesting, and exciting to put on a leather jacket and cut your hair that way and wear your, your all-stars and tight jeans and, you know, sing songs about, you know, pinheads and, and sniffing glue and stuff. But mind you, you know, he had been doing that for, you know, over a decade and a half now. They never got a hit. They were still touring around in the van. You know, Didi is older now. He's gotten sober. I mean, this really gives you context into how something like this goes down. And again, speaking to the fact that Didi is a true artist, you know, he gets exposed to something and he's attracted. You know, some people might not agree with this, but it's the truth. In the same way that punk rock was a grassroots counterculture mu uh, movement, um, hip hop in its own way is its own punk rock. Okay. That is its own counterculture revolution. You know, one could easily argue that hip hop and hip hop's beginnings were punk rock in and of itself, you know? And so the idea that Dee Dee, who is an outlier from the beginning with the Ramones, to be attracted to something like hip hop, especially as it's starting to like really, you know, expand itself, like, 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 you know, uh, break out into the mainstream with like run DMC and, and this, that, and the other, you know, it makes sense that that's something that he would chase. And he did. And then remember, as we've said about the Ramones and other bands, what do you get when you take the beach boys and the Ronettes and put them through the Ramones, you get Ramone songs. That's right. That when you let I me mean, listen to Sheena is a punk rocker is just, you know, Beach Boys meets like Renettes. That that's it, man. Straight up, straight the fuck up. When you take when you take something and you put it through a filter that is something else, it comes out something that you don't expect. In this case, when you take rap and you put it through Dee Dee Ramon, you get a song called "The Crusher." Right? I mean, how bizarre! How truly bizarre is that? That is bizarre. Um. Daniel Ray says, I wasn't involved with Funky Man. I didn't like it so much. I thought it was kind of sloppy. It was kind of rough. And I thought it would, it would be pretty short-lived. But he was determined to put some songs together. And Dee Dee wasn't a great singer. So rapping seemed to work for him. In fact, when you hear Dee Dee on any Ramon song, you can hear him on Warthog. And you can hear him on Endless Vacation. Yeah. In this vacation, it, that's how Dee Dee sounds. You know what I mean? <coughs> There's that clip of Dee Dee talking. You know, Dee Dee, who was a lot smarter than he would let on when he was doing these interviews. He's always kind of like, like plays aloof in the interviews. But like, you know, there's this great black and white clip of him being like, you know, we just we needed something to do so we sniffed some glue like just like playing it up like he's the simpleton when in reality he's the one that's penning all the lyrics you know and that was the thing you know i, did, I read somewhere else it's somewhere on one of these articles that dd i'm sure we'll come across it that dd you know he you know he could write i mean look no further than pet cemetery one of the last truly great ramon songs in fact I was even thinking of doing a top 10 about this, like, or a top five, like top five Ramon songs that should have been number one hits on the radio. And I think number one at that list should have been Pet Cemetery. There's no reason Pet Cemetery should not have been a number one song uh, on, on like mainstream pop album charts. It's so, um, 
commercial and so catchy and yet so Ramones all at the same time. I don't want to be buried in a pet cemetery. I don't want to live my life again. Like such a, what a Ramones lyric. If ever there was one Dee Dee, the, all the guys that are at Stephen King's house, because Stephen King is a Ramon fan, and Dee Dee wanders off, finds this is the legend. Legend goes, Dee Dee finds a copy. I think it's actually from his book, uh, Teenage Lobotomy or whatever. How I Survived the Ramones. He he just he he pops open the he pops open the book and and writes the lyrics in like twenty minutes. And it was the same with some of these songs on Standing in the Spotlight. I mean, the dude just it just poured out of him. You know, it just poured the fuck out of them. It's amazing. Um, I don't know how I got onto such a uh, kick about that. Uh, and I thought it would be pretty short lived, but he was determined to put some songs together. And Dee Dee wasn't right. We were talking about how he was a great, wasn't a great singer. Uh, so rapping seemed to work for him. He always needed to be busy. So if the Ramones were done with the record, he still needed to be creative. He was in a weird headspace at that point. He felt like he was being controlled by his wife, by Johnny, Johnny Ramone. And he was on all these medicines his psychiatrist was giving him. His whole life was laid out for him. Uh, what he was supposed to do and where he was supposed to go. He needed to challenge himself. Conformity drove him crazy. The Ramones became conformity for him. He just wanted to rebel against that. And one way was to do a rap record. So literally the most punk rock thing that the that a punk rocker could do would be to do the antithesis of that and try and make a rap record. It would get him out of the house. It would make Johnny really pissed off, which Dee Dee liked to piss off Johnny. When he started doing it, Johnny basically rolled his eyes. The unanimous opinion at the time was, oh, that Dee Dee. Man, Daniel Ray really understood. He really, really got Dee Dee Ramone. He knew who Dee Dee Ramone was in that way. All right, I'm going to play Funky Man. I'm going to play Funky Man, but we don't want to hear the... Uh, I don't want to actually play the song, so we'll just watch the video of it. So you can see here, there's the video. Look, there's Dee Dee. This is Dee Dee's idea of, of hip-hop. He doesn't really look like, uh, look at him. He's wearing his, his Converse. There he goes. That's Vera. That's his wife. Look at him walking down the street. And he looks like a Ramon. He just looks like he took off his leather jacket and that was it. This is actually a really great video. Look at him with the spiky hair. And he cut his hair like that because he hated the Ramon's haircut. Uh, there's, you could see that the, the, the red guitar, isn't that what he played? No, that's not a bass though. Look at him walking all weird. Where is he? It looks like he's like upstairs at like some venue, you know, like that's like the green room. Doesn't look like uh, an apartment really. Who directed this thing? I mean, this is real. This is an insane video. Let's get do a, a triple take of the doors opening a hundred times. There you go, Dee Dee in the streets. Um, let me walk into the subway station. It's just so weird, man. So friggin' what a bizarre, bizarre notion. The editing. Hey, let's have let's just have a bunch of guys walking behind me. Look at this guy over here with the shaved head. He looks like a skinhead, New York hardcore skinhead who's like, cool. I'm gonna be in a Dee Dee Ramon music video. That's fun. This is the clip you always see. And hey, all right, Didi, we're just gonna have you walking around. This is Didi. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm hip hop right now. Look at these guys. Look at these. These are punk rockers who love the fucking Ramones. They're like, I want to be in a Ramones video. They're not even. This is gonna blow your mind. All right, I just flash in my mind just now. Ready? Flash in my mind. If Didi Ramone really, really, really wanted to record a rap album what he should have done was he should have enlisted the beastie boys he should have had the beastie boys produce and back him as a band dd king and the beastie boys and together they would have found a way to do something that might have actually been commercially good they would have figured out how to focus dd and those guys the beastie boys they came from hardcore you know, they're Ramones fans. It would have absolutely worked. It would have been a perfect marriage. They're both in, from New York. 
Didi would have been able to truly, ex- you know, explore the the hip hop avenue that he wanted to. And the Beastie Boys would be stoked because they love the Ramones and, you know, they, they probably revered Didi and, and all that. And uh, you would get something so completely different from Funky Man. Look at him. And I mean, I guess you one could even argue that he almost got he got it out of his system with Funky Man. Like Funky Man is his legitimate attempt at doing rap hip hop, right? And you know what? What is in all honesty, like it seems like it's a, an experiment, but like where, where, what? What's the future here? Like, what's the honest future of Didi Ramon and hip hop? You know what I mean? Like, is he ever going to like, it, it, like, what is he going to release like five rap albums? It's just what is it one flash in the pan? Like, what was he thinking? You know, he had no sorry, he had no um long game. Lo- there was no long term game, you know. And when there's no long term game, things can get sticky. And you know what else is sticky? Friggin' stickers. And you know who sponsors this channel? Mother freaking riotstickers.com. That's right. Riot stickers is the sponsor of the from his channel you can get a thousand stickers for 79 dollars. do not hesitate make sure to sign up for riot stickers today uh get that special deal 79 dollars for a thousand stickers down link down below in in the comments these stickers have uh, a vinyl they're printed on vinyl which makes them waterproof they have a uv coating which protects from the sun let me tell you those reds they're the first thing to go on a sticker and the reds on my stickers they're still they're still red baby Oh, sorry. They are still red. So riotstickers.com, Riot Stickers, we are the bomb. We're gonna play our quick little video. Remember, get your riot stickers today. Those stickers are three inch by three inch stickers. Support independent businesses, support riot stickers. Um here we go. Where's that? Where's that theme song? That's right. Riot stickers. We are the bomb. Just a few updates for you. Those free t-shirts. Remember those free t-shirts I was giving away. That is still happening. Uh, announcement coming very, very soon. Keep your eyes peeled on all that goodness. Um, additionally, 31 days of Halloween is coming up. I invite all of you to join me for 31 days of Halloween. We're going to watch a minimum of 31 movies in 31 days and review them here on the channel. Uh, So expect new videos every day on top of everything that we already do here. Uh, If you're a YouTube member or a Patreon member, you should absolutely sign up because we have an incredible archive full of material that you cannot see on YouTube. Go do a search on my thing. You'll see all the videos that you can't actively watch. You can only watch them behind the paywall. And uh, that money goes to supporting the creation of so much you don't even understand. Uh, We just released the third part of the John Christ uh, interview. If you ever wanted to hear what Mother sounded like before it was recorded on Danzig One, it's original punk rock, death rock, Sam Hain origins. Um, John Christ played the arrangement for us. It was really, truly something else. So make sure you check that out. That's an early premiere. Eventually it will go live on the channel. When will it go live? Who knows? But if you can't wait, if you don't want to wait, now is the time to watch. We also have some secret shows. We just finished another secret show that released a little bit earlier this month. We have another secret show coming and we're also doing our read through of Mad Max, the novelization. I just released part five today on the channel. So you can listen in on the first five parts of Mad Max, the novelization. We're doing the whole trilogy okay now back to our scheduled programming 
we are talking about dd king and here is what they have to say about writing daniel ray says he wasn't using street drugs he was on meds and he smoked a lot of pot okay so he wasn't sober but but that was about it maybe he would score a nickel bag of pot just to be in control he would come to my house to work in the afternoon. He would just write down an idea and we would talk about what kind of song it would be an angry song or a happy song or a beach song or a ballad. And then I would try and come up with some music that matched the lyrics. And then we put it down on a four track. He would write the lyrics in like 20 minutes. There you go. I mean, the guy just wrote lyrics. They just poured out of them. And then the music would come together pretty quickly. It wasn't too sophisticated. And then he would have to call his wife and then go home for dinner. Dee Dee lived on two levels. He lived as someone who did what he wanted to do and someone who does what he knows is good for him in the long run. So having a wife to keep him in line and keep him alive and keep him in check. But it was, but he was only ever really happy when he was creating uh, G uh, G G says uh, Chung King was only about three people and we were the top, Wait, what? Chung King was only about three people and we were in the top. Okay, I get it. It was only about three people and we were in the top 10 record selling studios at the time because of the Beastie Boys. So the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and LL Cool J are all right there. He could have had access to the Be Beastie Boys, man. But it was a small crew who did everything from cleaning the place to booking the place to running the sessions. We were just having a ball back then. There were so many records happening. Uh, Daniel Ray says Warner Brothers gave him $25,000 to keep him busy. Let's put it out as a favor to Dee Dee. Wow. That, that is crazy. That is bananas. Uh, GG says at the time, 25 grand was lunch money. Nowadays, budgets are so small and everything is so controlled. But back then people would come in and we'd think, okay, what can we do today? But Daniel had a very clear vision. He's an amazing imitator. He has the ear and we mapped out the basics before DD came in. He was real. He was a real good spirit and gave DD really good support. He said it was about DD having something to get him out of a bad place. And very interesting recording. Uh, Gigi said, I worked with public enemy, LL Cool J, uh, Stets Stetsa Sonic, run DMC, but we didn't really make the record with hip hop techniques. Other hip hop guys would come in and dig through old records and find grooves and try to play stuff uh, off each other. But this was made more like an old time rock record with a drum machine. Uh, Daniel Ray says we had a first generation of a drum. We had the first generation of a drum machine and a four track, and we would go into the studio and do it the same way. It was pretty much just me, Greg, and Dee Dee, a cutting edge drum machine, which sounds so dated now. So they recorded that on a four track with a drum machine. That's nuts. Uh, Gigi says, Dee Dee was fresh out of rehab. So he was fresh out. That doctor's visit was a rehab thing. He was fresh out of rehab, and he was quiet, almost shy, so nice and polite and sweet. And he was just holding on. He was drinking these. 32 ounce iced teas, probably five of them in a day. One time he said, could you come to the store with me? And I would say I couldn't right then. He would just take the elevator and there was a convenience store on the corner, but he wouldn't go alone. This was Chinatown in the eighties. He was worried he was going to walk three blocks away and score. And here's the, the very famous record cover of this is Dee Dee trying to look like a rapper and he actually looks like joe palladio or whatever from uh day of the dead and whatnot very interesting blondie daniel ray says they're wonderful people referring to 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 blondie and big dd fans and you just ask them and they're there chris had an idea for a guitar part on german kid and we needed female vocals it was just family helping each other out Debbie's always an absolute joy. And Chris is very creative. Gigi says they were so loving towards Dee Dee. They were his friends and wanted to support him. Debbie's vocals took maybe 15 minutes and Chris played ride of the Valkyries really slow over German kid. I remember him cracking up uh, that it was going to work. 
we did a crazy remix of the song with a lot of samples from the producers. So we had Dee Dee rapping over springtime for Hitler. What that's that is insane. It was so outlandish and it exploded into a German boys choir. And the label was like, no way are we putting this out. That was the only time where we use traditional hip hop techniques. The lyrics, uh, Daniel Ray says, I think he was doing what you're supposed to do. Pride and positive thinking. Rap was pretty cutting edge. I think Dee Dee associated with the whole Gucci gangster thing. And he says that in a quote that we're going to read from the end of the century, the documentary where he talks about it. Uh, Daniel Ray says, where, uh, where you may be poor, but you have a thousand dollar chain on. It was like a party record. It wasn't just like a, a Jesus and a Mary chain album. Gigi says, there was a certain tongue in cheek. Sorry. There was certainly a huge tongue in cheek factor, meaning that they're not taking themselves super seriously. The whole macho hip hop persona back then. I mean, he starts out saying he's going to be a badass surfer, but by the end he gets bit by a jellyfish and he's like, I'm out of here. And he's going to be a badass wrestler. And then he gets punched really hard uh, referring to the crusher. I think even when he's saying I'm the master of hip hop, he wasn't trying to be Chuck D. I think he believed he was the, he was the king of being Didi Ramon. I don't think he was ready to get into the ring with LL Cool J. I think that's why he was struggling with. I think that's what he was struggling with. He was trying to be himself. And I think there's a big part of Didi's heart in that record. Reactions. Daniel Ray says the reviews were wonderfully brutal. What a, what a, that's a band name right there. Wonderfully brutal. And sometimes people would put out the record. Sometimes people pull out the record to have me nervously sign thinking that I'll break it over their head. But the best review is from maximum rock and roll. They listed the 10 worst records of the year. And at the end it says, we would have included the D.D. King album, but we only listened to albums that were recorded in English. That's my favorite. But it was Johnny's idea to put The Crusher on a Ramones record later on. I know that meant a lot to D.D. It meant that Johnny had actually listened to the record. That is very, very, very profound right there. Uh, Gigi says, uh, making it was, an, was absolutely joyful joyful i felt really fortunate i feel really fortunate to make records and whatever feeling is in the room ends up going into the record and that record was a positive support of somebody's life dd wanting to do something better than go down the tubes that's true if you're gonna go cop dope you know it's better to make a bad rap record than it is to you know go and score drugs uh it was a good ener it was a good energy on that record a very dd record you can't call it the worst hip-hop record of all time because i don't think it is a hip-hop record it's the best dd king rap record i imagine when the ramones came out people thought it was the worst rock and roll record ever made i mixed bring the noise often called the best hip-hop record if dd is the worst hip-hop record then I've got the spectrum covered. Daniel Ray says, it was on at a club I played last year and I enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. And it's where he was at this point. It is. It's like a time capsule. That's what it is. In the back of his mind, maybe he thought there would be a novel. He thought there would be a novelty single, but he just looked ahead. It's not like he worked his whole life to be a rap star. It was just an excursion. It was new, exciting music that he got into. He got into the Stones when he was 13. He got into the Stooges when he was 18. And then he got into rap. He could be mean and ruthless, but, de de but deep down, he could be mean and ruthless, but deep down, Dee Dee was like a little kid. The record, I think, shows his innocence, and it makes me miss him. Huh. So, and then... Here's another thing. We're not going to, I can't read through this whole thing. We could try. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could do it. Uh, this is an overview. Dee Dee had a genius for transforming. This is from by Nathan uh, Rabin from 2012, January 3rd. Funky man case file number 19. Ramones bassist Dee Dee King goes hip hop. And it's from AV club. 
Didi had a gene. I'm just, I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm just going to skip around. I'm not, I'm not reading this whole thing top to bottom. Didi had a genius for transforming the sadness, self-loathing, and degradation of his life into entertainment. He wrote songs about heroin addiction, Chinese rock, co-written with John Richard Hell. That's generous. Richard Hell wrote like a, a verse, a tiny verse. Male prostitution, 53rd and 3rd, and self-loathing that were so preppy, peppy, catchy, and, ent and energetic. It was easy to overlook their overwhelming sadness. In his tormented personal life, Dee Dee alchemized the love and adoration that the Ramones generated into pure, unbearable misery. On any given night, Dee Dee might have been the single most miserable, miserable person on the Ramones show. And he talks about it. Dee Dee talks about it. I think in PKM, he talks about counting, you know, where he was at, tracking where he was at in the, um, in the list, in the, uh, in the set list. And he knew that when they reached pinhead, that it was the end of the show. I mean, the, the dude, uh, the, the dude who would, who would wear the uh, pinhead mask zippy or whatever, he'd jump around on the stage and the stage would vibrate and it would shake the microphone. The microphone would, would crack, crack Dee Dee's front teeth, man. Like he was just, he was miserable. For Didi, the Ramones legend was an albatross that he could not shake rather than a source of profound pride. The group may have represented fun and escape to its army of acolytes and, admi and admirers, but for Didi, the Ramones represented control and conformity. So it just, it goes on and on and on here. Um, I'm going to just scroll down to the, here. In Lobotomy, this is his, this is his um, biography, his autobiography. Dee Dee devotes exactly 138 words to his reinvention as Dee Dee King. And here they are. Should I read them like Dee Dee? I don't know if I can. When I, when I got into rap, I didn't exactly win any popularity contests. I called myself Dee Dee King after BB King to the total dismay of my fellow Ramones. Billboard called my solo album Standing in the spotlight, a great party. I can't do it. I can't do it. And even said that my raps put the Beastie Boys to shame. Standing in the spotlight included some great experiments in rap and rock and roll and featured cameos by Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. <clears throat> I love I loved rap, especially in the early days, but I wasn't trying to shove it down anybody's throats. I didn't have the confidence to leave the band because of a solo career or anything like that. I just wanted to grow. I think that's the most genuine heartfelt thing of this, of it all that he didn't want to leave the band because of a solo career. He just wanted to grow. Still, the Ramones didn't want to change. They thought punk rock fans would hate me for my solo rap record, which was bullshit. Um, and then here's what he says in end of the century. And I think this is also, this is also at the heart of, 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 of everything, of his mentality, of his motivation. It's perfectly stated in what he says in the end of the century. Now, I just want to preface this. I'm going to quote Dee Dee here. Um, he's not using the N word. He's saying the word, and I'm putting this in quotes, if you can't hear me, he's saying the word Negro. And I know that that is a problematic word today. I am reading it as a quote. Uh, I know it's not quite, it's obviously, it's not what, you know, anything else is, but I'm just... I am paraphrasing the, the quote here. And if this is wrong to do, then my apologies. I am reading a quote, like I said, as quoted by Didi, who I, again, don't think was there was any malice in what he was saying. I think that when he uses that word, he's doing it almost, you know, He's doing it with ignorance, obviously, but it's like an innocent ignorance of the time. Like in, in the sixties, I do believe, you know, you know, and in, even in earlier than that, that word was, was you notice I'm not using the word outside of the quote, uh, outside of the quotation, at least trying not to apart from that one time. Um, that word was a very commonplace word, but since then it's become, I don't want to call it the N word because it's not the N word. The N word is the N word. So that's why I, I said it, verbalized it just now, because but I just wanted to just say that I recognize what I'm about to read uh, may, uh, you know, it's uh, touchy. This is what Dee Dee says, quote, unquote, 
when Schooly D came out with that album, he'd say, what time is it? It's Gucci time. You know, I understood that it's rising above oppression, a Negro being able to buy a Gucci watch. I get it. Great. I'm a Negro too. I felt the same excitement when I could buy a Gucci watch and spend a lot of money like an outlaw. I don't think it was worth fighting over. It was, it wasn't so good anyway. The album, I couldn't do rap. I was trying. I don't know how I'm not good enough to know. I'm not a Negro. Uh, as the passage su suggests, Dee Dee clearly identified with the underdog spirit of rap and the African-American sp slash black struggle to rise above oppression, but not alas to the point where he didn't actually stop using the quaint anarch I can't say that word anachronistic language like Negro quote unquote to describe his brothers from other mothers in the rap game. So as you can see, even the, the writer is, is mentioning that. And then they talk about mashed potato time. Uh, they're just doing some highlights over here. Let's all right. Let's, let's just take a look at this and we'll wrap up. Listening to Mashed Potato Time, I foolishly assumed that Dee Dee was experimenting with a Bobby Boris Pickett-driven uh, derived flow because the song was essentially an homage to the campy Monster Mash like song. It is. It really is. Complete with an amusingly unnecessary yakety sax like sax uh, saxophone solo. Oh, but I was wrong. Dee Dee raps like Bobby Boris Pickett pretty much the entire album. That's how Dee Dee actually rapped, though it's being overly generous to describe what Dee Dee did as rap and not, say, have a 10-track nervous breakdown. On Baby Doll, Dee Dee temporarily abandons his new rap persona for a, a tremblingly earnest ballad that's borderline embarrassing in its sincerity. It's like reading a 14-year-old couple's love letters to each other. This writer is a great writer who really knows how to write about music. Um. Though even love-struck adolescents might be embarrassed to commit uh, uh, to paper a couplet like, you smiled at me and I sat down and cried, and on that day, all the evil in me died. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Poor Little Rich Girl is the only track on the album that wouldn't sound out of place on a Ramones album. What about The Crusher? A nasty little punk rock number that finds Dee Dee singing about the miserable child of privilege and growing in growling rasp far more authoritative than his wobbly flow and off key band balladeering. Um, the air of professional, a remake of an old DD sharp song. Oh, interesting. Uh, the air of professionalism and com competency uh, quickly dissipates on German kid. The most bewilderingly, oddity the most bewildering oddity on an album full of them over uh, a slinky new wave groove the one-time swastika armband and hitler mustache enthusiast raps about deep pride he takes in his half uh to tetonic heritage with lyrics like you wouldn't you wouldn't believe the places i've been it's pretty cool to be half german Slap me five, give me some skin. I used to live in Berlin. Delivered in a half German, half... <laughs> delivered half in German and half in English. G Dee Dee tragically took no pride in becoming a core member of one of the greatest rock groups of all time, but couldn't wait to tell the world about his boring ethnic heritage. De uh, Deb Debbie Harry's sultry backup vocals somehow managed to make half American, half German sounds sexy, but nothing can possibly save the song on the album from being a morbidly fascinating tone deaf train wreck. Oh my goodness. Mind you, this is also the guy who wrote today, your love tomorrow, the world, which ironically, as much as I detest, you know, the Holocaust and Holocaust jokes and swastikas and all those things because of my own Jewish heritage, the irony is, and this is the truth. My one of my favorite Ramon songs of all time is, in fact, Today Your Love, Tomorrow Your, Your World, which is I'm a Nazi baby, I'm a Nazi, yes, I am. I'm a Nazi Shotzi, I'm gonna fight for the fatherland. Yes, that's right. 
That is one of my favorite Ramon songs. I'm sorry to say. Um, when I sing it, I don't sing that. I say um, I, I sing slightly different lyrics because I never want to sing it. But the idea of Dee Dee writing that and then having a Jewish Joey Ramone and a to Tommy Ramone with Holocaust surviving parents playing drums is mind melting. It's a mind melting notion. Um, <laughs> it is what it it is what it is it is what, i love today or love tomorrow i, I love this i love the the i love the uh not the lyrics the uh the um the 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 music is awesome man it's awesome it's friggin awesome while researching dd king i stumbled uh, this this guy who wrote this also is a great writer and did great research in his writing um shane i think his name was uh while researching Dee Dee King, I stumbled upon a vintage clip of Dee Dee being interviewed by Joe Franklin that manages to make an inexplicable project seem even more surreal. It's a bizarre meeting of the minds between a man patiently incapable of understanding rap and a man singularly unqualified to explain it. Franklin comes off like a, hol a hilarious parody of a clueless old codger as he fumbles to understand the power of MTV. Music videos are in, he barks, as if expecting a gold star for his observation, pronouncing Ramones as Ramones, as if Dee Dee were part of a Mexican boy band, misidentifies Dee Dee, uh, Dee Dee as the Ramones or Ramones drummer, and compares Dee Dee abandoning the Ramones surname to a Kennedy running, off, running for office as Jack John Smith. I think this is a hot news item, Franklin says, hopefully, of Dee Dee's radical shift in name and image. Dee Dee giggles nervously as he responded, responds to questions and statements that run the gambit from basic. Franklin actually asked Dee Dee to define what this crazy new rap thing is for the benefit of the home audience to nonsensical. Well, it looks like the, the interview is gone. Otherwise, I would play it right now. Uh, Dee Dee awkwardly concedes. Uh, sometimes they call it the worst video they've ever seen, but they love it anyway. The first part of that statement, I believe. Uh, Dee Dee unwittingly hints at the strangely poignant and innocence of standing in the spotlight when Franklin asks if his new rap album has the same social consciousness as the Ramones work. Dee Dee says that in sharp contrast to the autobiographical nature of his work with the Ramones, he presumably co-wrote Pet Cemetery, for example, out of a strong personal conviction not to be buried in a haunted cemetery for albums. He didn't co-write. I believe he, he wrote that. That is his singular work. His rap work is fantasy about a character named Dee Dee King who has various adventures. Within the context of Dee Dee's life and career, standing in the spotlight is less comedic than tragic, tragic comic. The, I like that word, tragic, and then you take the C on the end of tragic and you spell out comic with it. Um, the eccentric idiot savant, that's a, another great way to kind of describe Dee Dee. Uh, Dee Dee. He, he was an eccentric idiot savant behind the... Uh, behind it created a feral uh, character, a badass punk rocker, and called him D. Ramon to kill the pain of being terminally, terminally unhappy. Half German outcast named Doug Colvin. Then the pain and pressure of being D. D. Ramon became too much for him to bear, so he created D. D. King to free himself from the unbearable burden of being a Ramon, only to discover that he can never truly escape himself or his demons, no matter what he wore, what he called himself, or what kind of style of music he performed. And we see that very clearly in the video for Funky Man. Um, I think that's it. Later in, late in Lobotomy, Dee Dee writes that there are no real happy endings in the Ramon story, though sometimes it was fun. And that's true of standing in the spotlight as well. Like the rest of the failed attempts at reinvention I've chronicled here from the Kisses pretentious concept album, we got to cover that, The Elder, to Little Wayne's Rebirth. Standing in the spotlight was supposed to mark a new beginning for its creator. Instead, it was a desperately misguided dead end. But that's what art is sometimes. Sometimes art is misguided, even if it comes from a genuine, innocent place. It gets misguided, and then it gets destroyed. It gets brutalized, and we don't like it or whatever. I don't know. Um, 
In trying and failing to reinvent himself as a rapper, Dee Dee accidentally created a doo-wop, punk rock, comic book, hip-hop hybrid too weird and unpalatable to support even a single album, let alone endure as anything other than the horrifically botched experiment, a terrible idea wedded to an even worse execution. Great writing. Let's just name the writer one more time because they did such an awesome job. Sorry, this was by Nathan Rabin, and it's from, again, July 3rd, 2012. Thank you so much for joining me. If you did like this video, again, make sure you subscribe. Check out all the other content on the video. Leave me your skulls. I want your skulls in the comments or the live chat, preferably in the comments. Leave me your skulls so that I can hang them on my wall. If you want to support the channel, please consider joining the Patreon. Uh, it's not just join it and, you know, here's a thumbs up, although there is that tier. If you don't, if you don't want, if you want to do the most basic tier, you know, you, you have access to the early premieres and some of the back catalog, but um, it's the, it's the other one. It's the top tier one that gives you the full access to uh, a growing, growing archive of content that you cannot find on the YouTube channel. So please consider signing up um, again, subscribe, like, share, view, comment, laugh, cry, vomit, <clears throat> sing, bling, and most of all, rap. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Murdergram, aka Jeff Boyer D, aka Fremis, and we will see you next time. Peace and hair grease.